We had ten, five cars and nine drivers. And so Ken said, asked if I had the license. I didn't. Could you get one? I said, I don't see how I can get an FIA license. And he wrote a little note out. John Morton is qualified for an FIA license. Ken Miles signed it. Ken Miles said, take this to race headquarters. He had what? never seen your race and had never seen your real license, your SCCA license. Um, right. <laughs> he says, yeah. Ken Miles says you're qualified. Yeah. But he knew who I was. I mean, he worked at Shelby's. He, yeah, but you were the janitor. They needed a warm body. Yeah. That's, and, and, my, and I, had, I had a warm body. So okay. he said, take this to race headquarters and see if they'll give you a license. So I did. I took it to, I think it was the Kenilworth big old, old wooden hotel mm -hmm. where the head, headquarters were. And I gave them the note and they gave me an FIA license. From inside the Moto Man studio, these are extraordinary stories of ordinary folks and how they became the people shaping the car world, the tech world, and our future. I'm willing to bet that many of you have either heard of or know somebody that has lived the following story. Guy starts out from the bottom, probably pushing a broom, busts his ass over many years, and then one day becomes the CEO of the company. Now that's entirely possible in the business world, but what about the sports world, specifically the motor sports world, where it's not just about hard work, it's also about raw talent. Well, with today's guest, John Morton, we learn that that is indeed possible, but it was a combination of that hard work, raw talent, an absolute laser focus that got John behind the wheel of some pretty famous Datsuns back in the day. But there's so much more to his story that you are almost not going to believe because, well, I'll just let him tell the story. I was uh, attracted to racing from the time my dad took me to the races in the, at the Waukegan Speedway and a few of the little tracks in the area. But uh, the day he took me to Road America, my, my mother, my father, my brother and I went to Road America, the first 500. It wasn't the first 500 they had there, but it's the first, it was the Road America 500 in mm. 1957, the first sports car race I'd ever seen. And that day I decided that's what I'm doing. 15? Yeah, yeah, 14 or 15. Well, I did do that. Yeah, yeah, 15. Okay, so a lot of kids will say they'll see a fire truck go by. I want to be a fireman. Yeah. Or they, they'll see an astronaut. I want to be an astronaut. Yeah. But the percentage of them that actually make through. They usually get over it. They get over it. You didn't. So I what were you doing it. to not get over it? I jokingly say fear of work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wait, did you go to school? Did you actually go to university? I did go to Clemson for a couple of years. I went okay. and, and uh, when I turned 21 or got close to 21 and old enough to race, I decided I didn't want to go to school anymore. And I'm sure your parents were love that idea. Yeah, it's funny because. I wanted to quit in the middle of my second year, mm -hmm. and my dad begged me to go back. And I don't think it's because he thought it was gonna, I was going to finally get interested. I think it was because of the stigma of having his son <laughs> drop out of college in the middle of the year. But I did. I quit at the end of that, of 62, uh, mm -hmm. actually enrolled in Carroll Shelby's racing school. And when I went through, the, it was a week. And there was one other guy, and he had his own Corvette, and I didn't have a, a school car, uh, race car to drive in this, in the school. So they, this car that I was furnished was the uh, first Cobra ever made, the prototype. The one that just sold. It. Just sold for twelve and a half million dollars. It was a throwaway <laughs> that they said, "Oh, this is a school car. This guy's coming in from Illinois, and we got to have a car for him." And I think they had a couple other cars that were maybe dysfunctional at the time, uh -huh. so they stuck this Cobra out there. And, and they had never raced. Cobra had never been in a race at that time. Carroll Shelby came out to test the next Cobra that was built, the second one. Yeah. Well, Carroll was one of my heroes. I didn't know him. He certainly didn't know me, except that I was the guy that spent a thousand bucks to go to his school. That's um, a lot of money back it then. It was, and it was, you know, it kind of was the end of my education because that was my school money. You could have gone, gone in your own car for 500, but if they furnished the car, it was a thousand. And uh, I asked Pete, uh, my instructor was Peter Brock. I was really disappointed because I thought it was going to be <laughs> Carroll Shelby. I never you heard of Peter Brock. You disappointed that Peter Brock was your instructor. Yeah. Well, nobody ever heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> and I certainly hadn't. Um, I guess maybe he'd already done the Corvette stuff, mm -hmm. but you know, people didn't know that. The school had gone on for a couple of days, mm -hmm. two or three days before 
Shelby happened to come out to do the test with the cobra, the other cobra, and uh, I said, "Can you introduce me to to Mr. Shelby?" And he did, and I built up my nerve and asked him if he had a job that I might have in his new cobra factory. He said, "Come see him Monday." So That's quite a ballsy thing, man. You're right, literally right off the barge from Illinois, you're taking a racing school, and then I want a job. Well, I would have had to go back to Illinois, and there wasn't much going on there. I can understand. I, I really couldn't, and had no excuse to stay in California. So what was the job? Uh, janitor, at start. Okay. Started out as a janitor. Literally um, starting at the bottom. Well, he, work he said, let me show you what I want you to do, and took me downstairs and showed me where the buckets and the mops were, and what few things that needed to be cleaned up and did it give you pause like I, I came here to race I don't want to no clean not anything. really I was excited yeah no I didn't care what I did just how old were you at that point 20 so how did you go from literally mopping the floor to driving on the team it started out at Sebring in 1964 mm -hmm. I wanted to go re really badly and I wasn't a mechanic enough good enough to be part of the racing crew but I let everybody know I wanted to go anyway, mm -hmm. and I'd do anything to go. And I had another friend, uh, Jeff Schoolfield, who felt the same way. And they called us up to the office and they said, Mr. Shelby has authorized to give you boys $25 each if you'll drive your own cars to Florida and back, if you'll be night watchman at the track. So $25 to drive your own cars yeah. and put your own gas in the car? Yeah. Well, it's that a hell was of a the deal. gas money. It was a really good deal. Um, so For him? <laughs> yeah. No, it was a total scam, but um, Shocking we wanted to do it so Shelby. bad. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we've, there was a, another guy that did most of the wiring for the team. He had a Carmen Ghia. So we asked him if he'd take his car, if we could get another 25 bucks, and then we'd have $75, and we could probably make it in b there and back in a Carmen Ghia for $75, and he agreed. We get there about, I'm gonna say, five in the morning, checked into a motel in town. Back then, the, the, uh, the town square in Sebring uh, was where the tech inspection would occur, and the cars mm -hmm. were driven from the track to town to mm -hmm. do their tech inspection. So I heard the cars and I got up out of our cheap motel and went down to, to watch the tech inspection. I immediately ran into uh, Ken Miles and Lou Spencer. They were down, they were there for, you know, with the cars and, and Ken said, do you have a, an FIA license? And I said, no. I said, I don't, I, I just have an SCCA club license and it, I don't know where it, and I lost, I can't find it. I lost it. Um, I said, why? And he said, well, because we only have, uh, we don't have anybody to team with me in the 427. They had built a hot rod 427. They had five cars entered and they only had nine drivers. And he said, we might need you to drive the 427. And I said, oh, I, I don't. You must have about fell over. Yeah, I, I almost did, because I had raced one season in my Lotus Super 7. Never, never in a, a big car. Oh, we have to step back for a minute. You need to tell us what your first car was. You oh, kind of gave it away. When I worked at Shelby's, uh, when I turned 20, just before I turned 21, I bought a Lotus Super 7. It was brand new. Really? Yeah. The rest of my college money. <laughs> most of the rest of it. I don't know if you're aware of this, but there is this uh, current, there's a student debt crisis happening right now. Okay? <laughs> yeah. And this is the yeah. kids trying to pay their the school debt. Yeah. You have a Jaguar SK-150 and yeah. you had this Lotus 7. Well, uh, the Lotus cost me, I think it was $3,200. It's a lot of money in the It was. 60s. No, it was. It yeah. was pretty much all I had, and I wasn't making much at Shelby's. But I had an uncle who, who died, and he left my brother and me, I think, about $18,000. Yeah. And that's really what took me all the way through the mid '60s till I went broke. So this effectively was your investment to get started into yeah. into racing. Okay, mm -hmm. so now let's get back to see your first car is the Lotus Seven, and were you doing some racing on the side with it? Like SCCA? I was racing it. That I, I don't, it wasn't a street car. I just yeah. raced it. SCCA. So what was your daily driver at that point? Still the Jag? Yeah, I towed it with my Jag. 
<laughs> you threw a lotus with a yeah. J. Yeah. <laughs> I had a trailer hitch put on. Now do you see why I love this guy? <laughs> so back to Florida, you're in. You're they're, they're yes. saying, well, we may need you to drive. Yeah, we had ten, five cars, and nine drivers. And so Ken said, asked if I had the license. I didn't. Could you get one? I said, I don't see how I can get an FIA license. And he wrote a little note out. John Morton is qualified for an FIA license. Ken Miles signed it. Ken Miles said, take this to race headquarters. He had what? never seen your race and had never seen your real license, your SCCA license. Um, right. <laughs> he says, yeah. Ken Miles says you're qualified. Yeah. But he knew who I was. I mean, he worked at Shelby's. He, yeah, but you were the janitor. They needed a warm body. Yeah. That's and and, my, and I had a, I had a warm body. So okay. He said, take this to race headquarters and see if they'll give you a license. So I did. I took it to I think it was the Kenilworth big old wooden hotel mm -hmm. where the hel head headquarters were, and I gave them the note and they gave me an FIA license without even talking to Ken. No, just the note. No, I, I I'd give anything that. for that note. I I don't know where it, you know I probably left it there, but I'd love to have that note again. Well, as it worked out, I, I, I didn't have any equipment. Yeah. I went to the track and uh, bought a suit that was a little too big, and I didn't have a helmet with me, so I, there was a preliminary motorcycle race, so I talked to one of the riders, and, and he let me borrow his helmet to go in the 12-hour, you know, which was the next Amazing. day. And I had set this up in case and then when I, I said, talk to Al Dowd, I said, you know, Ken's practicing in the car. All the car, the other drivers on the team were Phil Hill, Joe Schlesser, Dan Gurney, Bob Johnson, Dave McDonald, Bob Holbert, um, Lou Spencer, Bob Bondurant, and Ken Miles. Okay. And me. <laughs> okay. I, okay, now I'm not even believing this story. <laughs> I cannot believe, have you met these guys before? Well, any like Bob Bond or any of these? Well, guys they worked at Shell. You know, they were in and out of Shelby. But had you met them prior to this? This. Yeah. Well, I. Mm, they'd seen me. <laughs> I don't know if they met me. This is. I was just an employee. And this is incredible, John. You literally go from being the night watchman to racing. We still had to be the night watchman. Only I was. I asked if I could practice, and Dowd said, "I'm not." Al Dowd was the team manager. He said, "I'm not letting you practice until Shelby gets here because I'm not taking that responsibility." Because you know, yeah, it was kind of ridiculous. So, Miles crashed the car, and it ran into a tree and really badly damaged it. So I said, "Well, that's it. I'm not racing." And okay. that car's not racing. But we worked there. We worked. Uh, through the night uh, and repaired it. Ken, my, Ken has broke, cracked some ribs when he hit the tree. And he's in there with his, still got his racing suit on and we're working on the car and he's got a port of power trying to straighten the frame and yeah. straightening the headers. I mean, it was hurt. Yeah. Um, and they got it well enough. It missed the, the first day. It missed a, you know, a day of practice or the, the day before the race, but the Two days later, it's ready to race, it, and it's started the race. Okay. And um, it's running, and the, the, what they thought they'd do is, with five Cobras, for sure one's going to break early, and they'd switch drivers around. Because yeah. the year before, the cars were so unreliable that everybody drove everybody's car. No cars were breaking, and it got later and later. And Ken is wounded because he's damaged himself in the crash, and the car's still... It's not running great. It's had some little problems, but he's still racing. And uh, and I thought, what the hell are they going to do? He can't keep him up there for 12 hours. Somebody said Shelby wants to talk to you, so we, so I went in his trailer, and he said, "Do you know this track?" And I said, "Yeah." Then he said, "When Ken comes in, are you okay to go out and take over for him?" And I said, "Yeah." I. I I didn't know the track. I mean, I'd, I'd been there as <laughs> a, spe blown away by this. a spectator. Yeah. I'd only been a spectator. I'd been there two years as in 61 and 62 as a spectator. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, uh, and then in 63, I rode in the truck when the Cobra team went down there. But I'd never been around the track. But he, 
he didn't want to know about details. He just needed somebody to get in that car. So I, I got my suit and that my borrowed helmet. And when Ken came in, you had to get out of the car to refuel then. The mm -hmm. driver had to be out of the car. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I was so scared he was going to want me to drive because now I'm scared. And he, he, he said, uh, I said, do you need relief? And he looked at me really funny. I remember he looked like, the hell are you talking yes, about? Yes, I do. So I got in the car and I started racing. Yeah, I drove it. Um, it, it had some brake failures uh -huh. and they worked on it and they didn't believe anything I said. Yeah. So they didn't believe that. They finally discovered the brakes had failed because they put Ken back in for one lap. Yeah, the brakes are bad. So they, fi they did fix the brakes. Mm -hmm. It was uh, a malfunction basically in the pedal assembly. And I drove it the rest of the day. It started, to, it was a slow death. And it finally, just at dusk, blew up. And so you didn't, blew. you didn't finish the first race? No, we didn't finish. We, we blew up about the time it was, I thought it was going to be cool to drive at night because I'd never done it. Yeah. And they had just pulled the tape off the lights and uh, the engine blew. So where do you go from there? Down. <laughs> 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 Down. No, actually, um, I bought a Lotus 23, traded the 7 Ooh, in. cool car, man. And I raced that, and Shelby entered it for me in races, painted it as team color. And it was my car, but he entered it as a Shelby American entry. And then at um, the Road America 500, I co-drove with Ken Miles in a real factory, uh, 289. Um, three of us, Skip Scott, Ken Miles, and I drove in the 500, and we won. How much time elapsed from the race, the, the Sebring race, and then to the time that Shelby's taking your 23 and putting it in, in races? Um, uh, it's that same summer. Same? Okay. Yeah. And did, after all this happened, uh, the, this, this amazing occurrence that happened in Sebring, did Shelby call you in his office and say, okay, you're not going to be sweeping the floor anymore? Are you going to be racing? No, not really. But I did drive with Miles and, mm -hmm. and Skip Scott in the, on the team. Shelby never and had we, a conversation with you after this? No, not about anything like that. But Ken obviously did. You know, if you go back, if you, <laughs> there was a connection with Shelby and my driving. Mm -hmm. um, I've... I raced in Illinois after when I first got the car. I took a leave of absence at Shelby because I went back to Illinois with my Lotus mm -hmm. and my Jaguar to to race in race tracks I, I'd seen as a spectator. I wanted to race at Elkhart Lake and mm -hmm. Meadowdale and those mm -hmm. tracks in the area. And then I was going to come back at the end of the season, which I did. Um, and the first race when I got back and got my job back at Shelby's was at Willow Springs. Mm -hmm. I still had the Lotus 7. And um, Shelby came to the race to watch Ronnie Bucknam, who was a very well-known West Coast driver driving an MGB. Mm -hmm. And um, he didn't, he didn't even, I don't think he even knew I was there, but I almost beat Bucknam. And he came up to me after the race and, and he said, we're going to, make you a team driver but That's this awesome. is way before this is this was uh several months before sebring but i don't think he really was you know he says things like that and then but there was obviously some like when he called you into that trailer that time it's not completely blind not not as blind no because yeah. of that incident at at uh, Willow Springs. Yeah, and he said, we'll make a list of everything you need for your Lotus because we're going to beat Chick Vandergriff, who was uh, the owner of the of the Bucknam car. Okay. Um, very prominent West Coast uh, race team owner. And, he, so and he said, just make me a list of stuff and you want, and I'll call Colin Chapman and get it for you. So I made him a list, and he pretty much forgot about it. And did any parts come from? Finally, car? a few parts came, but most of the stuff I wanted. So, what happens in a case like that? This is your car, but it's for now part of the, the Shelby team. This was a twenty-three. Yeah. And nothing happened. They they to transported it to the races for me. But you raced it. Uh huh. It's not like nobody else other. drove it. The only person that ever drove it was when I first got it. It felt strange because I'd never driven mm -hmm. a rear engine car, and I we were out at Willow just the, I mean, Riverside, the day we were leaving, the cars had to leave for Mosport that night. Mm -hmm. And um, 
uh, I asked Ken if he'd take a couple laps in it and see if it was okay, and mm -hmm. he did, and he said, yeah, it's fine. So you go from this, this, now you've got a different Lotus, and now you're actually doing some work with these guys and racing with Ken again. What mm -hmm. happens after that? I raced the Road America race, which we won. The next week I raced on the team at Bridgehampton mm -hmm. uh, with another driver, with uh, Joe Freitas, um, on the team car. And at the end, um, the team started with the GT40 stuff the following year, 65, mm -hmm. and, uh, and they ultimately, I, I don't want to call it fired, but I got laid off because they were just taking the best of the... Over of to the, England for the GT40 series. To Europe for yeah, the... Yeah. I mean, I don't think he would have considered me as a driver, but mm -hmm. even as a crew, and I, so I was kind of on my own. So what'd you do in those years? Oh, I struggled running the Lotus uh, for several years in SCCA, mm -hmm. and uh, I was a mechanic in the first year of the Can-Am for a team, for three different teams. Bottom line is you're not you're like you're not going and working at the equivalent of Starbucks of the time. You no, know, I never still had hanging a, around race cars yeah. and making money. No, I was race still cars. racing. Yeah, uh, at a very low, you know, a relatively low level. I tried the professional stuff, yeah. but I was I ended up without any money. So what changed? Um, I got a call from uh, Peter Brock one day, and he said, "Would you be interested in coming to work uh, at my at BRE?" Mm -hmm. And I, I said, um, "Yeah, maybe I'll come down and talk about it." What year was this? Late '68, early '69. Okay. So I I went down the next day and sat in his office, and he said. I can pay you so much. To, we've got to build another roadster. We've got one going. We're, we're going to build a second one, mm -hmm. and uh, we need somebody to. Well, his best fabricator had left, mm -hmm. so he said, uh, "We need you to, you know, work on the second car." Mm -hmm. And uh, and he offered me about twice what I was making. It wasn't a lot, but it was a couple. It w I was making like three bucks an hour at the oil wow. company. Wow, three twenty was. This was 1968. Mm -hmm. From 66 to 68, I worked there. I said, I'll take the job under one condition. And he said, what's that? And I said, that when the car's done, I get to try a, a tryout in it. And he said, yeah, OK. By the time the second car was done, I think it was pretty uh, well established that I was going to be the driver unless mm -hmm. I really wasn't any good. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I was uh, pretty good. I, did Peter know more about your driving at this point? Because yeah, he was early on. He was your instructor, but he had he followed you. Had you stayed in contact with him? Over Not really. No. So he didn't really know what was going on. He didn't know about the Sebring deal no. and all this other stuff. Oh, he knew. A, he probably knew about that mm -hmm. because it was kind of a goofy story. But yeah. I don't think he. F you know what I did at Sebring really was just keep the thing alive till it died. I mean, I wasn't. It'd it wasn't a, a competitive car. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. a competitive car, but it was, you know, it was an opening. But I knew I had a lot to learn at that mm -hmm. time, and still, when I went to work for Peter, I did. But I, but I, I had a, you know, significant amount of natural ability or whatever you want to call it, um, and I became his, you know, his number one driver. The Roadsters led to the Z car and won two national championships in that, and then the um, the five tens. We won two five two uh, Trans Am championships. The five ten was the first one that was actually a professional series. Mm -hmm. The the Z was an amateur, you know, SCCA at high level, but it was but you amateur. guys. So what was different about this team that you said? It, this is the first time in our discussion that you're saying this was a really good team. Like you had. You had racing gods over at Shelby, but not once did I hear you say this was a good team. You're at Peter's place, and now I know Peter, so I'm a little bit biased because right? I've, yeah. I've got a lot of experience with Peter. Great guy, <coughs> mm -hmm. so of course I would say that. Yeah. But why do you say that? Why do you say this was a great team? Um, Especially considering you guys had unknown cars back then. We this took was an two unknown. cars. The, the Z had had just come out. Yeah. Uh, the 510 was a cheap economy car. Yeah. Basically a cheap copy of a BMW at 2002. Really cheap. Yeah. Yeah. And that people put together winning cars, that the engines were fabulous, the engine builders. 
the fabricators, uh, people like Trevor Harris, who designed Formula One cars and mm -hmm. Eagles, Gurney's cars. Um, mm -hmm. George Fulmer won the championship mm -hmm. when he, when nobody had heard of George Fulmer. Bruce Burness was the guy that put that car together, mm -hmm. that Lotus with a Porsche. So all these guys were now working with Peter, and by default working with They you. were the team that was pretty much there when I got there, at Mac Tilton. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you were there Tilton well after the Hinos. Yeah, I watched the Hinos. I mean, I saw them, but saw I, them, like I wasn't ever, you know, -E involved in any yeah. way with them. It wasn't like Peter looked at a lineup of people and said, I want this guy, this guy, and this guy. Yeah. Um, he had a guy, George Boscoff, who was a very good guy, a good one of my very best friends. Um, and he was there through the Hino stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, so I kind of knew what was going on through George because we were very best friends. Mm -hmm. And he would give me reports on, and he says they're never going to get anywhere until they get an engine builder that knows what they're doing because Peter, <laughs> I shouldn't say. Oh, now you got it. <laughs> no, I've already said it. Um, <laughs> they didn't have a, they didn't have a very good engine system. And yeah. the, the, in fairness to the team, uh, the Japanese stuff didn't start out very good. Mm -hmm. So they were struggling with a, not a very the good Hino car. The Hino stuff? Or the, the Hino stuff. The Hino stuff. The Hino stuff. Hino stuff. Yeah. Um, trying to make the a race car. The avoidance of doubt, out. for people who don't know, that yeah. have seen inside the Motorman studio with Peter, uh, Hino, a truck manufacturer now with majority ownership, I think, by Toyota. Toyota, yeah. Uh, they were an independent car company mm -hmm. at that point and had this very cool car that Peter turned into a winning race car. And then all of a sudden, Toyota bought most of the stock and put them out of business. You mean the Hino was a winning race car? Well, well as winning as it could be. Sometimes they blew up on the trailer. Oh. <laughs> I'm not, no, Peter, I, Peter's going to see this. Of course Peter's going to see this. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't have, they had a lot of failures as well as really? a little bit of success. Yeah, yeah. But Peter, Peter was Peter, you know, he, he knew he knew how to do stuff. And did you have much exposure to Mr. K? Yeah, he was at a lot of the races. I I wasn't as close, you know. I didn't know him as well as Peter did, mm -hmm. but he was largely responsible for the enthusiasm of, that the company had for our program. Instead of a word from our sponsors, a brief interruption. As you can imagine, all of us here are incredibly excited about the return of Inside the Moto Man Studio. So much so, we'd like to bring you more guests more frequently and in the future make some of these live town hall events. So to that end, we'd like to ask you a favor. Can you help us get the word out? There are two really easy ways to do this. First and foremost, can you share the show inside the Moto Man Studio on your favorite social platforms? That includes Reddit. I would argue Reddit is even more important than the usual suspects. And then second, this is now a podcast. So go to your favorite podcast directory and subscribe, rate, and review inside the Moto Man Studio. However you choose to help us, we'd be greatly appreciative. And now, back to this incredible story. So what happens after 72? <laughs> we bought the, f the first lemon Lola had made, I think, ever. It was called a T400, and mm -hmm. it wasn't competitive. By the end of the season, you could pay another $10,000 to Carl Haas and get a backdate kit that turned it into last year's car, which was two seconds faster, the, pair of the guy who owned, owned the car did it. Yeah. We ran it at Long Beach, and then he went to, got out, ran out of money and eventually went to jail. And, uh, <laughs> and so Sylvia and I bought the car. We raced the Lotus, the Lola uh, 5000 car. Um, only one race we at where we actually owned it and raced it. We borrowed an engine basically, I think, more or less borrowed it from Parnelli Jones, mm -hmm. uh, Bell's Parnelli Jones. And uh, and then they changed the rules and turned it in, said that all these cars have to be Can-Am cars with full bodies. You get Sylvia and I scraped together $6,000 and turned it into a Can-Am car. And we did, you know, we did pretty well with it on a, a super limited budget. And then of ultimately we turned it into a Frisbee which was a different body basically and mm -hmm. was a very successful Can-Am car. Um, and we did pretty well with that. 
and then I started getting rides on other teams. I drove for Yost one time mm -hmm. at Le Mans, and we finished third with George Fulmer and Kemper Miller in 86. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did drive with Busby on the Porsche team for two years. It was B.F. Goodrich mm -hmm. Porsche team in 962. And did you drive with Hurley in the Jag or in the Porsche? Drove with Hurley in the Jaguar, okay. yeah, in 87. After Jaguar, I drove for, for the Electromotive Nissan team, the factory team, and yeah. and we dominated the series in uh, 80, 88. So now where, where are we? We are now in the 90s. We're getting into the early 90s. What's going on in the early 90s? Um, I drove for Nissan in the GTS car. We won Sebring in 94 overall. We won a, two other class wins. Uh, with Busby, we won sec. We were second overall in '86 in the Porsche, and then in the Nissan, we we won uh, overall in in '94, and we won the team won Daytona, but not the car I was driving. The one mm -hmm. I was driving was leading when it blew up, okay. broke a crank, and the other car won. And then the car I drove won Le Mans, won our class at Le Mans in in '94. Uh, there is something that I need to bring up here. It's very important that most people don't know about you. Very important. When did you yeah. get your pilot's I'm license? I'm only skilled person? enough to get a license. And <laughs> <laughs> it's a funny story. I always wanted to fly, but I, I never had enough extra money to do it because it's quite expensive. You can imagine this racing business took Yeah, a, took took a, yeah. and, and uh, when I was a little kid, I, I was more interested in airplanes and cars when I was a little kid. Yeah. So I raced with Pete Halsmer on the BF Goodrich team in 85. And uh, we were teammates on Busby's team, and we uh, we did well. We won Riverside, uh, and then we did well the rest of the season. And we got to the end of the season, and it was actually earlier than the end. Peter Halsmer was leading in the Porsche Cup, hmm. and I said, "Well, I must be leading too because we're driving the same car." And he said, "No, no," he said, "because Peter is signed up as the lead driver." I didn't, I'd never heard what a lead driver was, you know, mm -hmm. that there was any distinction. And yeah, with a Porsche Cup, they, you have to declare the lead driver, and he gets twice as many points as this, the, the other driver. Okay. So I'm getting half points, and he's getting all, you know, he's, by the end of the season, he finished second in the championship, and I finished, like, I don't know, 12th or something. We all, we got to go to Germany, and... Uh, the, his payoff was twelve thousand, I think, and mine was two. And he, he felt because we were friends. Yeah. Before that, and even after that, but he felt he was a pilot. He grew up flying. His father owned an airport in in Indiana. And it's uh, a great gig. Your father owns an airport. Well, a little grass field. Still I mean, it an wasn't airport. like a big deal, but it yeah. was. But he learned to fly when he was a teenager. I think before he was old enough to fly, he flew. Um, and he felt so guilty, he paid for my flying lessons for 10 hours. Because I made, well, he won so much more money driving the same car that I was Once driving. Once again, with. you have lucked into something amazing. Well, he, it was, you know, it was like 500, four or 500 bucks that he contributed so to. So when is this again, and this that's is 86? What, that's 86. Yeah. At the end of 85 is when it started. Okay. So where did you fly? You started down here in, in Hawthorne, okay. where I, I still have a hangar there. And you now have two airplanes. Yeah, I had one for, I had one before I even had a license. I, but I, I bought a plane, and I've still got it. The audience probably watching this knows you very well. I'm looking mm -hmm. here if there's any pictures. Like you back in the day when you were racing for for um, uh, for Peter, you look like you were 10 years old, man. <laughs> you, you know, you were you were young. Yeah, I was twenty seven or eight when I started with Peter. And I, I, I mean, I ha we have used these pictures in Peter's show, and you look like you were ten back then. Yeah, like you had the shaggy hair. It was very yeah, funny. I didn't like haircuts. <laughs> <laughs> it was the sixties, you yeah. know, late sixties, early seventies, hippies. Yeah. And you have a unique opportunity where guys who have tons of money and have these cool old cars. They pay you to drive these cars. Um, I get to race some vintage cars. Most yeah. of them don't pay much, but uh, you get to race not, vintage cars. It, I get to race cool cars. Yeah, very co you know car iconic cars. Even like at the Monterey Historics. Where at else? Monterey. Uh, Ever do Goodwood? 
been a good wood a couple times in Cobra Coops. But I drove like there were a lot of real Cobra Coops around. Well, there were only there were only six. Yeah. There never were more than six, and they're still all alive. The w one of the years I drove there with Phil Hill's son, and it was in a McCluskey mm -hmm. replica, which is exactly like a real one. But it mm -hmm. was, and then the next time was in a real one. It was mm -hmm. chassis twenty three hundred. Um, and you do this every year? You like you go to M Monterey, Monterey every year? pretty much every year. And next yeah. year, this year, a guy has already called to drive a Cobra Coupe. Very cool. Um, not a, a McCluskey, one, the one that belonged to yeah. Shelby when I drove it. Yeah. I actually drove Shelby's car. Okay. He did hire me. <laughs> he did sit down and <laughs> say, "Would you drive my?" But it was, you know. 40 years later. <laughs> <laughs> Fly to 40 years from this. Yeah, 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 Kid, thanks. you're going places. And he, and he said something that, you know, half the stuff he said, he just said. But he what? did say, you know, I should have I should have given you a more of a chance back then. So let's step back a little bit here. I, I still wanted to talk about the Monterey stuff, but, you know, you had the opportunity to work with Carol. How much exposure did you have to with Carol on a daily basis? And I mean in Venice. I don't mean out on the racetrack. Yeah. yeah. Um, he's, he was there every day and I was there every day and he'd come down, he, we weren't, I wouldn't say close, ever close friends, we were more friends after, you know, in the, you know, in the, have maybe tw 10 years ago. Would you guys go and have dinner together? You yeah, the sometimes, or? well, once in a while we'd have, we'd have lunch at his, at the Bel Air Country Club, which he was a member of, he was kind of the... He had the what he called the smart table with all the you know actors and yeah and people and why he, does it not surprise me that he is a member of the Bel Air Country Club? <laughs> That's just not I I felt a fish out of water, but but I went there quite a few times. Yeah. I had another friend who was a, a member, and sometimes we would sh we would have lunch yeah. with with Carol, but he and then I got you know I went to Europe with him when we ran at Goodwood. Mm -hmm. um, so we got, we became more friends later, and it's a weird connection with him all these years, because I re really resented sort of being As do most people that worked with him. Yeah, uh, because, you know, lots of promises and- uh, Did you ever have any exposure to any of the shady business dealings? No, only with me. Only when all my parts didn't show up for the Lotus. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I didn't. No, I never did. I, I know I've heard of stories, but I, I don't, I was not personally connected to any of them. Um, the reason I even knew him after the, you know, after the, the period where I worked for him, mm -hmm. um, about 1991, they had a roast for Shelby at Palm Springs. And somebody called me and said, we're having a roast for Carol Shelby at the Palm Springs Vintage Races. Mm -hmm. Would you be one of the roasters? And I how the, why the hell did they pick me? I, I'm gonna roast Carol Shelby. I'm, I talked to him for 40 years, 30 yeah. years. And um, I said, oh yeah, how, how does that work? And he said, well, you just talk for about eight minutes. And I said, okay, I'll try it. I was scared to death to do it because yeah. I'd never done any public speaking. So I, I practiced what I was going to say. I practiced. I never wrote it down. I practiced it in the bathtub. I practiced it for everywhere I went. I was working on it mm -hmm. for a month or month and a half. And then we get to the to the roast, and it's Gurney, Phil Hill, Bondurant, Brock, uh, um, a couple of. Uh, media people I didn't know mm -hmm. or don't remember. Um, Danny Sullivan, um, Zora Arkastantov, and me. Wow. I'm so, why am I here? I mean, I didn't. It's a great group. I hadn't been around. Well, I can tell you a couple of reasons why you're there. I mean, come on now. Well, I don't know. I really don't even know who called me, but I, I did it so, and I'm sitting there in Gurney's writing down what he's going to say. I said, I've been working on mine for a friggin' month and a half. <laughs> and he's sitting there while it's going on writing down what he, what Damn. kind of guts does he have. Anyway, I got up and I really did well. And I, I really roasted him Good. about some of the stuff that I really wanted to. So it was know. therapeutic for you. Yeah, it was. And it was, it really went off. It went off so well that somebody sitting near Sylvia said, 
said uh, to Lou Spencer, he said, oh, they got a professional up there. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the beginning of my speaking career. <laughs> yeah. And that's when I kind of reconnected with Shelby and yeah. we were kind of friends after. So that was therapeutic for you. What was it like like you guys, you Peter and Dotson basically mopped the floor with everybody else's ass in sports car racing in the US. Mm -hmm. And we're talking back in the day you were racing against Porsches, Alphas, names. And then there was you and a Datsun. What was that like? You're like, we just told, we just kicked Alpha out of the country. Forget about out of racing. <laughs> they're back. Well, but now yeah. they're owned by Ferrari. Yeah. <laughs> um, when things are happening, you don't feel all puffed up like a rooster. You just, you know, the, I don't know if I can win the next race. I never went into a race that I knew I could win, even though I got the, in the 71 season, in running the Z and the 510, we had to pull every race we ran. But did you, so, are you sitting there either driving to the track or driving away from the track thinking, I'm driving this crappy little Datsun, 510, no one's ever heard of, and there's a guy from Alpha sitting on the grid with me. Did, it, did, it ever, did you ever stop to think about that? No, not, not in those terms because I think we did have the best team and I honestly think if we'd had an Alpha we could have won the championship with an Alpha or a BMW. So it was the team, I not the car? So. It was both. The car was had great potential, Yeah. but I think the was team, team was more, even more important than the car. It was a wonderful period of my life. Yeah. I just wanted it to go on and keep, on keep going, being yeah. like that and it never was quite like that again. And I I was on some really good teams. The Busby team was good. The mm -hmm. the Nissan team was good. The uh, the uh, Jaguar team was good. But you know, the one thing that I've never had since then is anybody, any team that believed in me as much as they that team did. And what does that look like? Give me three attributes of when someone believes in you in racing. What does that mean? It, it just bolsters your confidence. I think they just knew that I had the capability, that there was no question that so I was you just felt. the best guy they w that was going to be in that car. Um, they felt that way. Okay. I never felt that way. Okay. But I, but you know, because he, he threw a lot of, at the last year, Peter threw a lot of other, you know, Peter Gregg, uh, Bobby Allison, Herschel McGriff, Bob Sharp, mm -hmm. Sam Posey almost as a challenge because we had a third car which was just as good as you know as every bit as good as the car I drove and uh, so I did have a yardstick that really was good for me to to build my confidence because I was able to go a little faster than than all the others what cars recently have you driven that are really cool like old cars besides the Steve 50 uh, well I on the same weekend I drove a 23. Um, <laughs> just drove a 23 and a T50. I feel terrible that, for you. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's the life you have led, man. Yeah. yeah girls come up, can I write a book about you? No. Girls don't even talk to me. Oh, that's girls write the only books one that you. ever did that. Um, other cool cars. Um, uh, GT40. I've driven real Collier's ones. GT. Yeah, real one. Oh, um, at Monterey, raced it. A 9083, a 908, not three, you know, the other 908, and then uh, a eight cylinder spider. Oh, yeah. Um, have you ever gotten driven a 904 GTS? Yeah. Of course you have. That is my favorite portion. Is it? My absolute favorite. It's just fiberglass. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, oh, a 91730. You guys drive it? Oh, man. Well, of course. Seinfeld had one. He sold it, but I drove. I got to drive it. At Monterey? To, no, I, at Willow Springs. Wow. And then uh, he had a, an IROC car. I've tested s some of his cars. When I grow up, I want to be you, man. <laughs> it's awesome. Okay, now. And the car that was in the, the 917K that was the feature car in the movie Le Mans. That car, he's. You know what I completely forgot? He's got that stuff. You do stunt driving. I did a couple movies with it, but I'm, I'm not 
primarily. I'm, I haven't done it in years. I thought you did a bunch of stunt drive. I did some it? movies and some TV shows. Yeah, like Rockford Files? I did a Rockford Files yeah. and a Switch and a Fantasy Island. And uh, <laughs> What did you drive on Fantasy Island? A uh, 5,000 car. The guy's fantasy was to be a race car driver. And you were the race car driver. <laughs> well, it was this race car driver. <laughs> you hung out with Mr. Rourke. Was <laughs> <laughs> I was the double for the race car driver. You have scrimped, saved, went broke, had incredibly fortunate situations happen to you, like turning up in Sebring, Florida, and being given a ride, and you don't even have a license. So you have busted your ass, not because someone's had money. How, what advice would you give that kid that, is just start and it doesn't have to be a race car driver it could be just starting out in life what what life lesson would you want to pass on um if you're fortunate enough at a young age to know what you want to do mm -hmm. don't ever vary from it unless you find out you're a total loser at whatever <laughs> it happens to be but if you want to be a uh, an actor or a singer or yeah. a race car driver or a an athlete. I mean, athlete. It's a little more clear cut. Yeah. You either. I mean, you, you, you are. You're, you're not going to be a football player if you weigh 125 pounds. But yeah. um, to stick to it and and don't do all this fantasy crap. You know, kids think they're racing because they play with a simulator and mm -hmm. and they think they they're pilots because they can do it on their computer. Yeah. But I mean, really, it's getting to the point I think where artificial things are almost becoming too important. So you're saying get out there and really be, don't be afraid to do it badly. You need to try it. Yeah, you, well, you have to do it to do it. You can't, you know, I've, dr I've driven simulators, the best simulators. You yeah. know, it's, uh, uh, Chris Considine simulators are spectacular. They yeah. make me sick. Yeah, I can't even do them. I can do a few laps and I get yeah. nauseated, but never air sick or car race car yeah. sick. But um, but really, it sounds like the, the they don't feel real to me. But it's what's key for you is I want to be a race car driver, and you stuck to it. You didn't waver. Yeah, because I I, mean, I could see situations where a kid's parents you go to the kid. The, the parents and say, well, I'm going to drop out of school and the money that I was going to pay to go to university, I'm going to go buy a race car. I could imagine the reaction a parent would have. So you're saying be very focused, yeah. but prudent about it. That's well, what don't be unrealistic. Is. That's the problem. You know, this people say in America, you've set your mind to it, you can do anything. You can't do anything. You well, might. like the football player thing, you're not going to yeah. be, if you're Yeah, and, and some people aren't cut out to be race car drivers. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they don't have, I don't know what it takes, but they don't have, there's a missing component somewhere. They want to do it, but they, they're they bothered by speed or okay. they don't have some sensitivity to whatever. Okay. Um, and that's true of any, any anything you might want to do. You okay. can't be a great singer if you have a shitty voice, a lousy voice. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and, uh, and and you know just be realistic about it. You can't. Yeah. But and I I really think living proof. Kids today are so focused on yeah on things that aren't real. And I think there's something about what goes on today with kids that they they we were talking about it earlier it tends to shorten your attention span. Yes. This instant gratification. Absolutely. It, and. Gr real gratification isn't instantaneous. Uh, if anything I have learned in this life, I have learned that. Yeah. Okay. John, I can't thank you enough for joining me here. Enjoyed it. It was fun. TJ, can you come here? This is our cameraman, TJ, also a proper car guy. TJ was so excited for this shoot. Look at the shirt that TJ wore just for John Morton. I did not tell him to wear that shirt. <laughs> TJ is such a car guy. He actually, TJ, what kind of car do you drive? I have a <coughs> Mazda Miata. So he's into he's into fun cars. Yeah, anywhere is cool. He's character. pretty stoic too. 
<laughs> you gotta be quiet back there. <laughs> okay, thank you, TJ. John likes Rocket Bunny also. So. Yeah, I think that's a really cool <laughs> shirt. Okay, we gotta get I'd one definitely of those. wear one of those. Many thanks for joining us throughout the entirety of this episode, and don't forget, subscribe, rate, and review Inside the Moto Man Studio on your favorite podcast directory. And while you're sharing, how about on your socials as well as on Reddit? Until our next incredible guest, be später.